So Hashim wants to discuss the topic, um, does the Bible teach that Jesus is God? It absolutely does. If you look into the sayings of Christ, he uses sayings that a mere prophet cannot say. For example, uh, in John chapter 8, verse 58, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And he's absolutely referring back to Exodus 3.14, where God says to Moses, tell Pharaoh, I am has sent you. Or the Greek Septuagint says, uh, tell, tell uh, Pharaoh, I am, uh, I am he who is, or I am the one who is being has sent you. Depending on how you can translate that from the Greek Septuagint into English. Uh, Christ also does this in Revelation 1.17. He says, I am the first and I am the last, which is a title of uh, Allah in the Islamic theology also, the first and last. So this is absolutely a title of God that he refers to himself. Uh, this is actually from Isaiah 44 verse 6, because in Isaiah 44 verse 6, God says to Isaiah, I am the first and I am the last. So for Christ to use this saying, if he wasn't God, if he was just a prophet, would be blasphemy. He would be making himself equal with God. And in John chapter 8, we actually see this. The Jews accuse Jesus of making himself equal with God. And in verse 59, they actually pick up stones to try and stone him to death for what they consider blasphemy. So I'll let you pick up more. Yeah, I would rather, I would prefer we have one point at a time. Because what happens otherwise, yeah, what happens otherwise is like we don't have much time or it'll be quite long for me to respond to you for four points that you made. So choose one. You want to start with uh, Exodus 3.14? Whichever you like. Okay, so... Do, do Exodus 3.14, but also John 8 as a whole. Yeah, of course. Okay. So John 8.58, John, John 8.58 and Exodus 3.14. If they were equal, let's look at the Greek translation. Like you said, let's look at the Septuagint. Because the Septuagint says, Ego emi ho on. It doesn't just stop at Ego emi. Because the, the predicate there is quite important, the ho on. And this is not mentioned in uh, John 8.58. So I don't know why somebody would actually use John 8.58 to refer to Exodus 3.14 when in Exodus 3.14 the one I, the one being is the important bit which is left out in John 8.58. So maybe you want to ref, uh, refute that point I made? So this is the Greek Septuagint, as Hashim yeah. uh, referred to. Is it okay if we stand a bit? Sorry, yeah, this sure. is the Greek Septuagint that Hashim referred to. And in uh, verse 14, is actually translated from the Greek Septuagint into English in these words. Then God said to Moses, I am the existing one. So when Jesus Christ says in John 8:58, before Abraham was, I am, the Jews absolutely understood that to be a claim to, divi to divinity. Because in verse 59, if ultimately Hashim's argument is that Jesus wasn't claiming to be God here, then why in verse 50, uh, 59 did they take that saying as blasphemy? Because in verse 59, they took up stones to throw at him. So they tried to stone him to death for what they considered blasphemy. So if he wasn't claiming to be God, why the, why the harsh punishment? Okay, so just because the Jewish people say that it's blasphemy or they want to stone him, that doesn't prove anything because that is their perception, that is their view. In fact, the Jewish people, they reject Jesus as a Messiah with all the uh, prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. So it doesn't mean anything just because the reaction of the Jewish people means nothing as far as what I'm saying is look at the Exodus 3.14 and I'll read the English from the Exodus 3.14 uh, mentioned in the Septuagint. So it says, and God said to Moses, I am, yes, ego emi, the one being, ho on. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the one being again, ho on, has sent me to you. Jesus did not say any of that about the one being. So you see, the predicate is missing when they translate it in English, or maybe this is not what Jesus wanted to say. Now, when the Jewish people wanted to stone him, they also wanted to stone him in John 10, 30, when he says, I and the Father are one. Yes, but we know clearly that Jesus did not mean that he and the Father are one in essence because otherwise he wouldn't defend himself in John 10, 34, where he points that you are called gods. This is referring to Psalm 82, 6. Yes, you are ref referred to as God, I'm paraphrasing you. Yes, and all I said is I am the son of God. So you see, he's actually not making the claim that he's God. If Jesus was God, then do you really think that Jesus would worship a God? Okay, yeah. so he's referred to uh, Exodus 3, 14, John 8, 58. He hasn't yeah. actually explains why the Jews wanted to stone him to death did. after he immediately said, I am. Because the Jews understood that to be blasphemy. If you read earlier on in John chapter 8, he then says, if you do not believe that I am he, 
you will die in your sins. So when he says, if you do not believe I am he, he's absolutely referring back to the I am statement of Exodus 3.14, earlier in John, and also in John 8.58. There's no way around that. He absolutely is doing that. But he just touched on uh, John chapter 10, saying, you know, uh, ye are gods, etc. He's right. That is referring to Psalm 82. But let's read this in context. Let's read the whole passage, and not just one verse. He, all due respect, he arbitrarily picks and chooses. Let's start in verse 31. Jesus answered them, and bear in mind, Hashim using this argument, he can't actually believe Christ even uttered these words as a Muslim, because if Christ uttered these words, then that means that he would be committing shirk, and he cannot believe as a good Muslim prophet he said these words. So let's start in verse 31. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Key word there, Father. The Quran says Allah is not the Father of Christ. I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. Now what prophet can grant someone eternal life? This is not a saying from a mere prophet. This is a divine claim. I give them eternal life. Okay. One, uh, once, I'm in finished. Okay. Oh, okay. is there more? Okay. Yeah, just down to there, yeah. Right, okay. uh, and they shall never perish. Neither uh, shall anyone snatch them out of my hands. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hands. I and my father are one. Now this is another divine title. If Jesus says I am one and he's just a prophet, what prophet can claim to be one with God? Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And while they pick up stones to stone him, if he was just a good Muslim prophet, claiming monotheism in the Islamic sense. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shown you from my father. For which of these do you stone me? Then the Jews, and let's bear this in mind, Hashim wants you to believe his interpretation. We should believe the interpretation that was conceived of at this very saying. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself God. They understood Christ was claiming to be God because they said, you being a man, make yourself God. They tried to stone him for blasphemy. Let's continue. Uh, Jesus answered and said to them, it is, it is written in your law. Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. And the, the, uh, the context here is they are representatives. They are representatives of God. For example, uh, God says to Moses in Exodus, I will make you God to Pharaoh. Does this mean Moses is now divine? No, it means he is a representative of God before his people. So these people who had the scripture given to them were representatives of God to his people. And the scripture cannot be broken. And do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent in the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. So clearly exactly. Jesus is saying I am the Son of God. So the point here, Hashim, is not that you are also gods. He's saying if it's right for you guys to be called gods as representatives of God, is it not more fitting for me, the actual Son of God, to be called the Son of God, as he says here? Okay. So you see at the end there, he didn't say I'm God. He said I'm the Son of God. Now if the Christians insist that Jesus was God, why is Jesus telling them as a clarification to that blasphemy, yes? So if you don't mind, is it okay? Sorry, yeah. We stand a meter apart because you know why. <laughs> okay, so if Jesus was indeed God and that is what he was actually uh, um, blamed for, you see, they actually were accusing him that you being a mere man are claiming to be God. Then why did Jesus at the end say, I am God's son? He had to actually say, I am God, but he didn't say that. Because this is exactly what Jesus tells you time and time again throughout the Bible. That my father is greater than I. I can of myself do nothing. He says many things like that. Can you imagine John 5.30? God telling people that he can himself do nothing. This does not sound like God. This sounds like a servant of God. Jesus clarifies to you that these disciples even were given to him by whom? By God. By his father. Yes, the technicality here of the term father is not used in the Quran because the Quran in Arabic is very clear. The term Allah is used. You cannot use the term Allah for anyone, any false God. And that is the reason the term Allah is used in the Quran. However, the term Elohim can be used for false gods, can be used for non-gods like Moses, like the example he gave, can be used for angels. So you see the Quran is very specific in the terms it uses, like the term Allah is only used for Almighty God. Similarly, Jesus himself never ever claims to be Almighty God. As we have seen in Exodus 3.14, yes, the true God will say the one being. Yes, which we know in John 8, 58, he did not say. But anyway, we have moved on from that. We have gone to John 5, 30. Sorry, we have gone to um, John 10, 30. He's saying the, uh, the Jews picked up stones again. So what? The Jews have always wanted to kill him. They always wanted to say that he's blaspheming. In fact, they tell, they tell him that you are a Samaritan. You are devil poss possessed. Do we believe that? No, we don't. So let's keep things in perspective. The, uh, the question here is, is Jesus... God Almighty, 
according to his own statement. So far, I've not seen any statement. Oh yeah, he did mention about, um, in, in the beginning, he said that um, uh, the Alpha and Omega. Yes, in that case, you should worship uh, Melchizedek because he says, in the case of Melchizedek, he had no mother, no father, no genealogy. Yes, no beginning of days, no end of time. You, you took quite a while. I think you should have patience now. Yeah, you should. Yes. Yes. No, no, but I was, I didn't tell him to finish. I, I let him finish. I let him finish. But he's doing it to me now. So let's be fair. What I'm saying is that just because Melchizedek did not have the beginning of days, the end of time, are you going to worship him as God? And are you going to be consistent for the Alpha and Omega statement? So show me once again a statement from Jesus Christ, clear cut, unambiguous, that is claiming to be Almighty God okay. from the Bible. Okay, now Hashem brought up, um, I don't know if he knows where this is found about Melchizedek. It's found in Hebrews chapter 7. Okay? I know where it is. Yeah. Okay, so where is, okay, where is, where is, uh, is your time where is Melchizedek finishing? mentioned in the Old Testament? Tell me. It's, it's, it's your time. It's your time. I never said I don't know. Then tell me, where is he found? Just read it. Okay. It's your Melchizedek time. Melchizedek is found in uh, Genesis chapter 14. Okay. Now, Melchizedek is not a theophany, as some people believe. Some people believe Melchizedek was a theophany, a vision of God in the Old Testament. That's, that's not the case. Melchizedek was a real person. In uh, Genesis chapter 14, he is called the King of Salem, okay, which is shortened for Jerusalem. Okay. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, Melchizedek kind of comes along. We see he's got a priesthood and he disappears. And when uh, Hebrews mentions he has no mother, no father, that's not mentioning the fact that Melchizedek is God, because it doesn't say he's, he is like Jesus. He says he's, um, his ministry is like the, the ministry of Christ. He says Un unto like the Son of Man. Now, how, what does that mean? Because his ministry, his priesthood, the Christians believe has no ending, Christ's priesthood, as our, as our eternal high priest, uh, before the Father, mediating on our behalf, never ends. That's the comparison that's being made, the priesthood, not the divinity of Melchizedek, because he's not, because the book of Hebrews is all about the deity of Christ. The book of Hebrews begins in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, by saying that Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God. So why would Hebrews begin by saying Jesus is of the same nature of God, and then forget about that and say Melchizedek is God? Makes no sense. Now, he did bring up uh, John chapter 5, verse 30. Now, I'll read it to it, you, because Hashim did quote it correctly, so thank you for that. I can do nothing of myself. That, that, that's what it says. It says, I can do nothing of myself. But why did Jesus say those words? We have to go back to verse uh, 17 to understand why he can do nothing of himself. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father. And notice earlier, Hashim said he wasn't trying to call himself the son of God. That's not what Jesus meant to say. Well, here we have it, because you call, your, because you call God your father. Making himself equal with God. With Christ, time and time again, made himself equal with God. Hashim says that never happens. The text says otherwise. If we continue to read in, uh, in verse 19, then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. There's that language again. But what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son does also in like manner. So whatever the father does, the son also does. So the fact that Jesus says, I can do nothing of myself, is perfectly suitable, considering that if he is joint nature with God by virtue of the divinity that they share, he's not going to become a rogue deity and go off and do his own thing. He is going to do everything in perfect accordance with his father. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that they may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Now, can a mere prophet raise the dead and give them life? Absolutely, positively not. Okay, let's continue. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all should honour the Son as they honour the Father. Now, how do we honour the Father? We honour the Father through our worship. So how should we honour the Son? Through our worship. Now, Hashim uses verse arbitrarily, and we have to notice this, his methodology is ultimately arbitrary. When you pick a verse here, pick a verse there, ignore the verses before, and ignore the verses after, okay? That's why his method fails, because it's arbitrary. Because if we take the reasons why Jesus can't do things of his own, as it says here in these previous verses, we understand why Jesus said these words. It's not because of what Hashim said. Now, I want to ask you, can you believe that Jesus Christ said these words? That Jesus Christ will raise the dead? Can you believe those words? Can you believe the fact that Jesus Christ said, um, all judgment has been given to the Son. Can you believe the words of Christ when he said, if you honor, the way you honor the Father is the same way you should honor the Son? Now, if you believe what Christ said in verse 30, why do you not believe what he said in the verse where he says, if you honor the Father in that way, honor me in the same way? Okay, so lots of uh, passages there once again. So awesome. that's, that's fine. Is it okay if you stand a bit Sorry. far? Please, I keep repeating this. So what I'm saying is that if 
God, if Jesus is only doing what he sees the Father do, what does that mean? That means he has, he's contingent on the Father. Can God be contingent on anyone? He's independent of everyone. The fact that Jesus is saying that he, sorry, he, he mentioned something about raising the dead. So what? Jesus was given the ability to raise from the dead or raise uh, or do miracles, as he says in Acts 2.22. Yes, he is a man accredited by God to do wonders and miracles amongst us through, sorry, through Jesus, uh, God does it through him means through Jesus Christ all right so what it means is that Jesus has been given this ability by his God yes very clear and by the way raising people from the dead is not something unique only to Jesus we know that uh, in the Bible Elisha does that yes in fact it goes on to say that in this um, there's a passage in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 13 one, uh, verse number 21 where he says, once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body in Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, remember this, the dead man's bones, Elisha's bones, a prophet's bones actually. Yes, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. My God, if the bones can have miracles, a dead man's bones can bring people to life. Then why are you so, uh, I don't know, um, why are you giving such importance to Jesus? raising people back from uh, dead to life. If a dead man's bones can do that, then why can't Jesus do it? Okay. So again, once again, you haven't shown anything from Jesus where he claims to be God. Remember that is a topic. Okay, now, as I've just said, in, uh, Hashim's pointing out that uh, there were prophets who also rose the dead. Yes, there were. There were Paul raises a dead man yeah. when Paul is preaching and a man falls asleep on a windowsill, falls to his death, Paul raises him up. Does that make him God? No, it doesn't. But this passage, which Hashim actually ignored the context, is talking about the resurrection on the last day. Now, Hashim cannot believe that Christ is going to resurrect the dead on the last day. Yes, prophets, by the power of God, can resurrect, uh, can raise up dead people. They can resuscitate them, absolutely. But this is talking about the resurrection on the last day. He's made a category error. He's saying that they can raise the dead, Jesus can raise the dead. Let's put these in the same category. That's not in the same category. The category where Christ raises the dead is on the last day. Hashim can't believe that, but yet he uses a few verses after that to prove a point. Now, let's go back to chapter 5. I want you to answer these questions. But also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. You ignored that part, sorry. You ignored that part. So why do you ignore that part and only arbitrarily pick the verses you want? So well, back to my original point. This is about talking, resurrecting the dead on the last day, not a miracle performed by prophets. I grant you that. Prophets can do that. But this is talking about resurrection on the last day. Which one? The two kings? No, no. Chapter 5. But I mentioned the keep, two kings. Yes, keep up. I'm grant, are you not listening? I'm granting you, Hashim, prophets can raise the dead. By oh, the finally. Of okay. I'm granting Good. you that, but I'm saying you're making... A because you actually said they like, couldn't do that no, no, earlier. No, no, it's on camera. No, 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 on the last day they cannot do that. That's only, that's only something that God can do. But okay. Let me, so let me speak. You're making a category error where you're saying that uh, prophets raise the dead. There have been the bones there and kings. You're absolutely right. That yeah. says that. Prophets have raised the dead by the power of God. The apostles did it in the, in the uh, book of Acts. Okay? Absolutely. But okay. That's not, I think you're... Are you done not, now? But that's not resurrecting the dead on the last day. Pick up that point. Can Jesus, being a prophet, resurrect the dead on the last day? And can Jesus, calling God his Father, make himself equal with God according to you? Bear in mind you quoted a few verses after that, but you arbitrarily ignore the, the passages that come before. Okay, so anyway, we know that there are prophets and even dead bones that can raise people back to life. So that's not a big miracle which only Jesus did. Others did it as well. Pick on that. It's Don't my turn. It's my turn. Don't interrupt. So what I'm saying is that he earlier said that it's only, the, uh, it's only Jesus who will judge on the day of judgment, yes? However, the Bible says otherwise. Is it in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28? This is, remember, this is after resurrection. This is after resurrection when people will be judged. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal, renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on, the, on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now you tell me, can ordinary people who are not even prophets, Yes, have the honor of judging on the day of judgment. According to him, it wasn't. It was only the Jesus who was given this power, not even the Father. However, we have passages in the Bible which completely contradicts what Ben here is trying to posit. Now, let's, let, let's read where the Father actually judges. It says in John 8, 50, it says here, I am not seeking glory for myself. Jesus is saying this, yeah? I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Now, where does it say that he will judge on the day of judgment here it is since you call on a father who judges each person's works impartially 
live out your time as foreigners here in Reverend Fear. 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1.17. So you see, the disciples judge, Jesus judges, the Father judges. How many gods have we got now? Who has got all this honor of judging? Important, the day of judgment is quite an important day where everyone will be judged. But here, who is judging? The mortals are judging and God Almighty is judging as well. And then Jesus is judging as well. Finished? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Now notice he didn't actually address my point, he just ran on to his next point. Unfortunately, we seem to, we seem to be playing whack-a-mole. He brings up one argument, we knock it down, he runs to another one. This is not consistent. Stick with the top, stick with the particular passage we're referring to. Don't run here, here, there and everywhere because you can't answer the point. I asked you specifically, answer, why did Jesus calling God make, him, uh, make himself equal with God? Why do you ignore that part but arbitrarily go to the part that you think fits with Islamic theology? And yes, the 12 disciples are given judgment. Now notice, who gives them that judgment? Jesus says you, you, you will be able to judge the 12 tribes of Israel because there were 12 apostles, yes? They judged the 12 tribes of Israel. It doesn't say they, they judged the general dead on the, on the last day. It doesn't say that. Jesus gave them this judgment. So how can a myth, and bear in mind, if he's just a prophet, how can a prophet give people the ability to judge on the last day? Of course, that's only something God can do himself. Therefore, Christ is God. So his arguments don't actually disprove the deity of Christ. They point to the deity of Christ. But again, go back to John chapter 5. Why do you ignore the parts that clearly point to the deity of Christ? Okay, so he's saying that I actually run away from the points. You, you know, you are the one who brought in a lot of points when I was dis discussing Exodus 3.14. Yes, does that mean you ran away from that point? No, because you couldn't respond to the how on, so you went to another point. And that's what right, exactly... Right stop interrupting, point. Ben. Stop interrupting. You said we were done with that point. No, stop interrupting. Up. I didn't interrupt you. Even though you were actually making a lot of uh, low blows there, I didn't interrupt you. If that is the way you want to debate, then I, I think you should probably try somewhere else. What I'm saying is that when he says in John, sorry, in Matthew 19, 28, it says Jesus said to them, yes, truly I tell you at the renewal of all things, when the son of man sits on the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones, yes, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. First and foremost, it doesn't say Jesus gave them the judgment, which he actually tried to imply. It doesn't say that in that passage. Secondly, what will they be judging them on the day of judgment about? Yes, why would these Mortals, who are the disciples, be judging the 12 tribes of Israel, which is actually all the Jews. So all the Jews will be judged by these apostles. And it doesn't say in that passage, which he tried to wrongfully imply, that this was given by, by uh, Jesus as, a, as some sort of a judgment to them. In fact, Jesus was given the abilities by his God, yes, which you do not imply, uh, which you haven't addressed yet. Why did Jesus, was he given the disciples by God? He was given the abilities by God, like, like it says in Acts 2.22, which you have an address. It says nowhere in the Bible where Jesus claims clearly, categorically, that he is Almighty God. He is always praying to God. Imagine this. Can, does a God pray to another God? If he is Almighty God, whom is he praying to? Yes? Let's see if he can address those points that I've raised now. Okay. Now notice again, he jumped over the passage I brought up. I asked him specifically in John chapter 5, when it says Jesus calling God his own Father makes himself equal with God. For the third time, Hashim answered that point. Stop running here, there, and everywhere. Stop doing the Hashim shuffle and, and actually answer the point. Christian, I'm about to, my friend. Yeah. So again, when he says it doesn't explicitly say Jesus gave them, it doesn't say Jesus gave them this authority, but it's Jesus is the one who's telling them, you will judge. So yes, is Jesus saying, you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. If, if, who, what prophet can give people judgment on the last day? So here's, here's the point. Well, he's not asking the point. Let him finish, let him finish. Let him, guys, guys, let him finish. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. If, if Jesus we, saying, we can see on the camera, Jesus don't worry. Jesus is saying that these 12 disciples are going to be the ones that judge the 12 tribes of Israel. It doesn't mean the general resurrection of the dead. It says nowhere like that, Hashim. If they're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel, what? listen, okay, okay. Who can give that authority but God alone? Can a prophet, can a prophet, could Muhammad say, you guys are going to judge, uh, judge certain people on the last day? Absolutely not. But again, I want you, to I want you Hashim, to go back to John chapter 5 and address the point where God, Jesus calling God makes himself equal with God. Okay. Why do you ignore that? So I'm not ignoring that. In, fact, in fact, you actually, br you brought in the same. He made a correction that it wasn't Jesus who gave them the authority. And then, that. let me finish. No, you're lying. I didn't say that. Well, they will see it on camera if I'm lying. I did not say okay, that. so stop interrupting me. Remember who's interrupting now? Remember who's interrupting? Okay, not me, him. So what what he says over there, clearly Jesus did not give them the authority, which he tried to imply. Jesus, nowhere over here in this passage does it say that Jesus gave them the authority. Jesus informed them. Yes? He says, truly, if sorry, he says here, truly I tell you. 
Yes, at the renewal of all things. I tell you, not I order you. There's a big difference. So if, imagine this, if somebody tells me that the weather is going to be great today, does it mean that he actually made the weather great? No, it just means he's informing me of the weather, that's all. I, I think you should take some English classes in order to find out the meaning of this because this is so clear here yeah, that you cannot fault it. Now, when he says that Jesus made himself equal to God, how is he making equal to God when Jesus prays on his face? Yes, in the garden of Gethsemane, yes? In the garden of Gethsemane, he begs his God to take the cup away from him. Yes, let it be your will be done, not my will. Remember this, Jesus, according to that belief, is one person. Why is he saying that his will is different to that of the Father? Unless they are two different individuals, two different entities. And if they are two different entities, then how are they one if they have the same will? Unless they have diff different wills, that's the reason Jesus says, let it be uh, done with your will, thy will, not my will. What is this? Take the cup away from him. When the time came for his crucifixion, he's praying to his God. In fact, he's begging his God. He's pleading with his God. How? He puts his face on the floor. Yes? And he prays to God to take the cup away. What is the cup? The cup here is a cup of, uh, of crucifixion. He's telling the God, his God, that if there's another way, show him. Yes? But let it, let it, the end result should be the will of the Father, his God, not the will of Jesus Christ. So if they are the same being, tell me why do they have same uh, different wills? Okay, Hashim made a Christological error. He said that Jesus Christ is two persons. That's what you said, yes? No, I didn't say that. What did he say? Watch the camera. Okay, I believe... Okay. Wait, wait, bro, wait. So why does Jesus Christ... Yeah, he said two different entities. It's a question. The, the, Remember. The, the, Christian belief, the Christian belief is this, is that there is one being shared by three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I showed you earlier, Hashim, that Jesus shares nature with God according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says he is the exact imprint of the nature of God. Now, a prophet can't share nature with God, so what's all that about? You'd have to answer that. You, you ignored that actually earlier. Two wills, that, explain no, that. One second. That was a question. Okay, I'll explain two wills. The yeah. early church, uh, in, in, in these councils they had and whatnot, you can read the early church, they said that the will is something of nature, not of person. Okay? So Christ having two natures, the hypostatic union says that um, in Philippians chapter 2, for example, it says he entered human flesh, okay? So when Jesus, and then let's bear this in mind, there's not two persons in Christ, that's Nestorianism. Uh, Saint Cyril wrote 12 anathemas against this, uh, blasting Nestorianism. Because what, can I explain this Nestorianism? Explain the two wills, so, that is a question. The Nestorianism, this heresy is basically... No, no, no need to explain the Nestorianism, explain the two uh, wills. I'll, I'll explain how I want, okay. So the two wills is this, ultimately, if Jesus is one divine person, there is no human person in Christ, Saint Cyril says this, okay? There's no human person in Christ, there is a human nature. Okay? okay, so Jesus Christ is one divine person who took on human flesh, he took on a human nature. So taking on a human nature, of course, takes on a human will. But in the garden, as he said, you see these two wills. He submits his human will to the divine will that he shares with his father. Now, why does Jesus pray? Why does Jesus pray? Okay, Jesus prays because being of the same essence of God, when he comes down from uh, heaven enters human flesh, he's not going to become an atheist. He's going to continue that relationship with his father through earthly means, which is through prayer and worship. So just and I noticed that prayer you mentioned, Hashim, yeah. which somehow disproves Jesus... Uh, uh, being being uh, the son of God, in that prayer, he actually calls God his father. You can't believe he even said that, Hashim. So you're quoting passages of Christ, you cannot believe he even said, so your arguments are self-refuting. You're quite the Christian apologist, actually, Hashim. But anyway, I want to draw you back to chapter 5. You ignore the passage. No, yet. I did not. Yes, I've already answered. No, no, so no, 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 no. You just said... I think your turn is no, over now. Second, it's my turn now to respond. John chapter 5, one second. One second. Wait, wait, wait. You just mentioned... He won't explain that. You just, briefly men you just briefly mentioning, Hashim, you just saying John chapter 5, then running into three different verses, doesn't do anything. No, it's the same, it's the same the argument. I can go to any verse I want, I can answer the way I want. Okay, so you're saying Jesus actually has two wills. That's what he said. He said he shares one will with the Father, and he's got a human will. Does that mean he has two wills? Yes? That's a, that's, a that's a heresy in itself. What heresy is okay. that? What heresy is that? Go and look it up. Go and look it up. Can you tell it? Go on. I will, I will. In my time. It's my time. We'll stop interrupting. Okay, so it entails two people. When you have two wills in one person, it entails two persons. This is what I was trying to gauge from him, and I knew he would fall for that. That is the reason I said. So let's, you know, now this is the crux of the matter. He'll think I'm running away, but I'm making, he doesn't realize that I'm actually picking pixel, pixel, pixel to draw a picture for him. I hope he gets the full picture when we are finished with this. So you're saying on the cross, yes? Because Jesus is only one person. Remember this, this were his words, yes? On the cross, from the three persons of the Trinity, who died? Sorry? Repeat from that. the three persons of the Trinity, which person died on the cross? The, Can I address the, your point the second person? No, no, is that the second person? The son, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's my turn still. Son, yes. So he's saying the son so died. Now remember this, the second person of the Trinity, Yes, it is. It is. It's about the, it's about whether it's God. Yes, I'll tell you how it is. Now he's interrupting. Now the cameraman is interrupting. So JC is interrupting. None of our cameramen are interrupting. So now he's not my cameraman. Okay, so what I'm saying is this. 
if Jesus, if Jesus is the second person of the Trinity and he said the son, the son died, the second person of the Trinity died, what does that mean? That means he is not immortal. Me yes, yes, of course you'll answer in your turn. Now it's my turn. So JC was trying to say, and there's nothing to do with the topic. Yes, it is. Because we are trying to prove whether Jesus is God or not. Remember this, God does not die. First Timothy 6.16, he alone is immortal. Yes, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. No, I will answer you. You'll have to wait your turn. Now what I'm saying is that if Jesus is the second person of the Trinity and the second person of the Trinity died, remember this question earlier, Jesus is, no, 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 I'm, I'm answering. Okay, so don't interrupt me. What I'm saying is that if Jesus is the same in nature as that of God Almighty, God Almighty never dies. He's always immortal, but Jesus died because he says there's only one person and that one person is the second person of the Trinity okay. who died on the cross. Okay, fantastic. Now Hashim once again is showing that he's a poor Christological student. He doesn't understand the early Christological heresies that the early church dealt with. Ultimately, he might not realize, or you guys might not realize it, but he's just accused me of the heresy of Nestorianism. Okay? I didn't, I didn't. No, okay, without even realizing he's done that, so he doesn't okay. even realize it, okay? Now he's saying that to say the son died on the cross is a heresy, yes? No. I said that makes him, that, okay, the two wills, that shows he's not immortal. Okay, okay, that's, that's it. That's okay. not, he's not immortal so the, so the wills, if he died. Okay, the two wills was argued about with Nestorius and St. Cyril, okay? Nestorius ultimately denied the term Theotokos. The, the word Theotokos... Well, I'm talking about what, didn't it? That's to do with Mary. Yeah, yeah, Theotokos. This, this is what gets, see, he doesn't even realise this is the argument it comes from. So the <laughs> argument it comes from is this, Nestorius and St. Cyril. Nestorius said that Christ is not Theotokos, he's only Christotokos. Theotokos means that uh, Mary was the bearer of God. She bore God in her womb, okay? Christotokos, which is what the story is taught, he said that she only bore the Christ in her womb. Is he immortal? So, so That's the question. So ultimately, he turned Christ into two persons, okay? And these two persons had a will each. There was two wills within the two persons. But the hypostatic union is not that doctrine. Saint Cyril said, and ultimately, if he's going to accuse me of this heresy, he has to accuse Saint Cyril of the same heresy. Is he immortal? That's the question. Though, even though Saint Cyril Stop was, running. Saint Cyril was the one who fought against the heresy he's accusing me of. And Saint Cyril says the same thing as me. Saint Cyril says in his 12 anathemas against Nestorianism, he says, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ, God, suffered in the human flesh, you are anathema. In the Greek, which means cut off, accursed, you're, not, you're no longer in the faith, okay? Now, he said, um, what did say? It, um, immortal. immortal. Is okay, he immortal? He used second, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse uh, 16. 16, to say that, he's, that only God is immortal. Let's read this uh, intelligently, and let's see the context, okay? Let's start in verse 14. That you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potent, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. Now... This, this, this one who has immortality is called Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Now, if you understand Trinitarian theology, this makes perfect sense when given the context. But bear in mind, the one who is immortal is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Is he immortal? Yeah, That's he, the question. He's immortal, yes. How? But he died? Then, Hashim, stop interrupting. Oh, look, have you feel so, now? Stop, the, one, you know. <laughs> the one who is immortal is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Now, if you continue reading the Bible, you will find out who this Lord of Lords and King of Kings is. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus Christ is called the Lord of Lords and the King that of Kings. That wasn't a question. Revelation, is he immortal? One second. Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, Jesus Christ is called the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So if, according to Hashim, the one who is immortal is Lord of Lords and King oh, of Kings, thank you. Jesus Allah. Christ is Lord of Lords and King put of that Kings. In. By Hashim's own logic, Jesus Christ is therefore immortal when you take into the Trinitarian perspective by virtue of the divine nature. Yes, the human nature died on the cross. We believe that. I knew do that. Saint, Saint Cyril says this. And if you, want to accuse, if you want to accuse me of this heresy, you have to accuse the man who fought against the heresy of committing the same heresy, which is retarded. So is he immortal or not? So is he immortal or not? You haven't answered that key yes. question. Okay, is death, is, is death the end of existence? Answer. Okay, first and foremost, no, 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 remember no, no, no. this. No, no, you, JC, why don't you just shut up and let us talk, okay? So I will, well, he's interrupting, that's the route. Your guys are interrupting. No, they're not my guys. This is your guy. These are not my guys. I don't even know their names. You said nothing. Okay, so what I'm saying is that the question was the second person of the Trinity died. Did the first person die? No. Did the second person die? Sorry, yes. Did the third person die? No. That means they are not the same co-equal in nature. One is immortal. Sorry, the two are immortal, the Father and the Holy Spirit. However, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, did not die. Do you remember how he tried to actually, uh, uh, I don't know, shove that under the carpet? He's saying the nature died, the human nature died. Remember my question? Which person died? Yes? So now who's making the wrong uh, interpretation over here? The interpretation is not 
which nature died, because we're not talking about the nature of Jesus. We know he has two natures according to Christology. However, my question was, did he die? And he said, yes. Who died? The second person of the Trinity died. That makes him mortal, not immortal. Okay. Okay. I haven't finished yet. Now, well, stop doing uh, that, please. okay? When your turn was there, I didn't push you like that. So, now he hasn't answered that question. He's run after the nature of Jesus Christ. We didn't ask about the nature of Jesus Christ. We know that. So, please stop answering questions which you did not ask. Do answer the ones that I did ask you. Is God immortal or mortal? God is always immortal, yes? Whether he's called the King of Kings or whatever the title is. If this God is Almighty God, then he will forever be immortal. We all are mortal. He is mortal. I am mortal. All of the people watching are mortal. The only one who is immortal according to 1 Timothy 6, it says there, he alone is immortal. The term alone is exclusive only to Almighty God in that context. And the term immortal means never dying. It doesn't mean not cease to exist. So there's the answer to you. That doesn't mean cease to exist. That means separation of the soul from the body. Did that happen to Jesus? Yes? Which soul separated? How many souls does he have? You already said he had two wills. How many souls does he have? Go on. Okay. Bro, no one cares about your camera, right? Just stay out of here. Mind your business. Why is he inside you for, man? That's okay, you. Okay, so Hashim's actually, once again, without even realising, Immortal. He spoke about another Christological heresy. He's made a blatant error. He says, if the son dies, does that mean the father dies? No, it doesn't. Now, what he just said, what he just said is a category error. Okay? I never said that. You, no, you said, <laughs> I didn't say you that. said, if the father dies, does that mean the, the son dies? Does that mean the father dies and the Holy Spirit dies? That's no, a lie. I never no, said that. Did say that? <laughs> but anyway, anyway, let me yeah, finish. Let me finish. We're going to do a flashback in this video. You so can do a flashback, no problem. Okay. I'm sure you're already having flashbacks okay, now. Okay, that's fine. So, okay, the heresy he's just brought up is called Patripassianism. Have you ever heard of that? Yes, I have. Okay. Carry on. Tell me what that is. No, no, carry on. It's your turn. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He acts as if he does. Exactly. Is he immortal immortal? Remember, he's running away from that. Patripassianism is the heresy that ultimately comes from Sabalian. Yeah. Sabalianism is the heresy of modalism, that the God is one exactly. person, one being, therefore when Christ died on the cross, as Hashim said, does that mean the Father died? Not yet. Tertullian said Sabalianism is Patripassianism. Patripassianism is the heresy, as he's just said. Didn't it was a lesson about heresies today. The father dying. Is he mortal or immortal? Answer that. Mortal immortal. That's the question. Is the heresy that the Father suffered death? Christians have never believed that. Saint Cyril in his 12 anathemas said, if you do not believe the Son of God died in human flesh, you're anathema. I encourage you, Hashim, read church history. This would clear up the okay. our argument. Do we believe Jesus is immortal by virtue of the divine nature? Yes, he's immortal. When yes, he, when, yes when finally. He, see, Hashim says these things. <laughs> the, Christ, <laughs> the, the Christians be, have always believed for the centuries yeah. as if he's made a killer point, <laughs> as if we've never thought about this. Oh, so you always thought he was more... <laughs> Back to life. He, he makes his have you finished your no, education in heresies? No, I haven't, I haven't. You haven't, okay. You need an education. So go on. You already you admitted he was about. not immortal. Okay. No, no, wait, wait, I didn't but. say Have he patience. wasn't immortal. Now he's putting words in his mouth again. Yeah, yeah, also, was he immortal or mortal? Make up your mind. By the virtue of the divine nature he shares with the Father, he's immortal. When he took on human flesh, he died in the human flesh. That's what Christians died in human flesh. Which person died? The second person of the Godhead. Now, was he mortal? What? Sorry. Was he mortal? The second person of the Trinity. The divine nature is immortal. So he didn't die then. Make up your mind. Did he die or not? Have you ignored everything I've just said? Person, I didn't ask you in what nature he died. Which person died? The second person of the Godhead died in human flesh. Which means he is not immortal. Anyone who dies is not immortal. Saint Cyril, Saint okay, anyway. Saint Cyril says this. Doesn't matter, Saint who? Twelve anathemas. This has been taught throughout Christian history. Hashim needs to keep up. That's why you are believing in a three gods then, maybe. So what he's saying is that because of, by virtue of the uh, essence of God Almighty, who is always immortal, Jesus is immortal. How is that? When he clearly states the second person of the Trinity died. The fact that he died shows that he is not immortal. What does the, maybe you should go and define what the term immortal is in this context. In this context, if no one died from the Trinity, which again, he, he wants to eat his cake as well. He wants to have his cake and eat it at the same time. So he wants on one side to say that God, Jesus is immortal, but then he also wants to claim that he died on the cross for, to redeem his sins. Otherwise, his sins wouldn't be redeemed. JC and Ben will be forever eternally sinners. And not be forgiven. They will never enter heaven. Because the only way that sins can be forgiven is by the human sacrifice. Yes, I say human sacrifice. Because until you tell me that God died on the cross. And if that is what you're saying, then you already finished the debate. No. The fact that Jesus claims that... Sorry, uh, you claim that Jesus died. The second person of the Trinity died. That itself shows that he is not immortal. By the definition of immortal, which means the one who does not die. Go and look up the word Athanasia. Okay, it means someone who does not die. Someone who is not subject to death. In the context of 1 Timothy 6.16, that's why it says, 
immortal. Their loan is immortal. Remember this. When you die, your soul lives on. Yes? Which means your souls become immortal. This is after your death. So you do die. And then your soul becomes immortal, eternal bliss or eternal damnation, depending on the judgment of God Almighty. Yes? However, I'm not saying when you die, you cease to exist. What I'm saying is that the fact that the soul separated from the body of Jesus Christ is a proof that is, he died. Like he says in Romans 10, 9. Yes? That who raised Jesus back to life? It was God who raised him back to life. Imagine this. God Almighty raising another God of theirs, Jesus Christ, back to life. Can you imagine this? The resurrection, Jesus might have said that I laid down my life and I lifted it up again. That means he never died if he's going to lift his life again. Either that is true or the Father resurrected him. Which one is it? Because the Bible is full of contradictions. Whether you bring St. Cyril or you bring some Chalcedonian creed or whatever creed you want, at the end of the day, there are a lot of holes in your narrative and this is very clear that you cannot have played both ways either jesus is immortal or jesus died on the cross you cannot have it both ways if he died then certainly he cannot be god because god is always immortal okay anyway so once again notice hashim's run from every point i've ever mentioned john chapter 5 still hasn't been answered he mentions done you know he mentions uh, timothy chapter 6 verse 16 first timothy and, uh, first yeah it doesn't matter timothy you can say timothy so first timothy chapter 6 verse uh, 16. 616. 616, that's what I said. 616. Why are you just repeating what I'm <laughs> Why saying? Why are you getting so uptight? Just... As if you're making a point, Hashim. I'm correcting anyway, your I, references. I said 616. So anyway, Good. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. As he said, he goes back to this again, saying, this is the immortal one. The immortal one is called Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Doesn't matter. Jesus is called Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Doesn't it, matter. it absolutely matters. Doesn't matter. He Jesus, died. Because once again, Hashim is pointing out a divine what? title of God that is referred to uh, to Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's a divine claim. Thank you, Hashim. A God doesn't you are, die. You are quite, End of story. You are quite the Christian apologist. Now, also, <laughs> we see Jesus did claim to be uh, eternal when he says in Revelation 1, Eternal? I am the first and I am the last. So it's Melchizedek. What, what prophet can claim to be the first and the last? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. No, absolutely nonsense. We've, we've addressed that. <laughs> no, you haven't. You about. haven't. He doesn't, he you ran to Abraham. I asked him where was Melchizedek found in the Old Testament. I don't have to say it. It says in <laughs> Hebrews 7, 3. He's found a verse here online yes, somewhere. Which is against you. You have no answer. From uh, Akhmadi. That.com. It's ridiculous. Ahmad they're still okay. reeling on that, you know? Ahmad Didad blew such a blow to them that these guys cannot forget his name. Alhamdulillah. May Allah give him Jannat al Firdaus. Say Amin, Muslims. Hashim, Hashim is actually a better debater than Ahmad Didat. I'll give you that. Ahmad Didat was a No way. I'm a student. And nothing more. That might be why you're making the same mistakes. That explains why I'm doing mincemeat of you guys. No, he said that, uh, Come on, he's immortal, immortal. Get said, to the point. God, Answer the point said, I'm making. He said that God raises up the body of Christ. Yeah, well, let's listen to what Christ actually said. In verse 19 of John chapter 2, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up on the last day. So he didn't die. He then goes on to say, What do you mean he didn't die? If he raises it, then he's not dead. He then goes on to say that he was talking about the temple of his body. So you said God raises up Jesus. Jesus says, I raise up my own body. By your own logic, Jesus is God. Again, oh, you are is quite the, oh, the Christian apologist. It's a contradiction, actually. You, are quite, you didn't realize that. You are quite the Christian apologist. Yes, I am. Dealing with you guys, I've become quite an apologist that you guys cannot answer simple questions. Remember, he ran away from the answer? mortal and immortal. He ran away from it. He did not answer that because he knew that is a death blow. From the time of Sheikh Ahmed Didat, these guys had not, not responded to the point. Because you see, if God Almighty has certain attributes which only are attributed to God Almighty, nobody else. For example, the fact that he, ne he never dies, that he's immortal. The second attribute is his omniscience. That means he is all-knowing. When Jesus was on earth, yes, he was one person. Remember, not two persons, one person. So this one person did not know the last hour. However, what does he say? Nobody knows the hour, not the angels in heaven, not the son except the father in heaven. So he's making a clear distinction in the knowledge that he has about the last hour and the knowledge that only the father has. Remember, only the father, again, one person who is distinct from this other second person of the Trinity, who is distinct. Yeah, sure. No problem. Last statement. You started it, so I'll have the last question. So, so I'll, I'll give a wrap up after. Yeah, you can give a wrap up, but then afterwards I have still one more turn. So what I'm saying is that. Jesus is immort not immortal. He is not omniscient because he doesn't know the last hour. In Mark 13, 32, he clearly says that he doesn't know the hour. Only the Father knows. So again, this is a clear testimony from Jesus Christ himself. Remember the argument of this entire debate is whereas Jesus claimed to be God. So I've shown you from Jesus' own, um, uh, from his own testimony that he doesn't know the last hour, that he himself is the one who was 
actually, actually according to their own uh, belief, that Jesus died on the cross. The second person of the Trinity died on the cross, which makes him disqualified from being immortal. Now you can carry on, but you still have an answer about the immortal. So I, I was hoping you would do that. Okay. This is going to be my, that was Hashim's low. And the omniscience as well. This is going to be my closing statement. No problem. I've answered Hashim. Let's bear this in mind. Hashim has not answered John chapter 5. Okay, he's totally ignored what I said, where it says that Jesus explicitly made himself equal with God. What does Hashim do? He runs to Melchizedek. Okay, <laughs> anyway, let's continue. Which you have an answer? He, he also, I actually did answer that. No, you I didn't. asked you where could you find the Melchizedek okay, anyway. in the Old Testament. You couldn't even tell me. I don't me. need you to. Found a verse it's in the New Testament. I think it's going to be a shotgun blow, and actually it's retarded. Let me continue. You read this passage that uh, he mentioned in Timothy 6.16. I've answered this explicitly already. That one who is called immortal is called Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Matter. We see Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So by that, by his own logic, Jesus, therefore, is this Lord of Lords, King of Kings, who is immortal, therefore is God. Because only God is immortal. Now, in terms of the cross, do we believe, and Hashim thinks he's, he says these things as if he's found some great argument that Christians have never actually thought of. He says things that Christians believe as if he's making an argument. I agree, we believe what you've said, that the second person of the Trinity died on the cross. He died. died he died in human flesh. Died. Saint Cyril in his 12 Second anathema, person died. Saint Cyril in his 12 anathema says, if you don't believe the Son of God died in human flesh, you're anathema, you're cut off from the faith. Now Hashim isn't aware that any of this is spoken about in church history, but he just finds a verse here and there, thinks it suits his theology and runs with it. Now, he mentions, um, what was the last point you mentioned? How about his omniscience. Omniscience, okay, thank he you. Now, okay, I'm going to give you the apostolic teaching on this, okay? The word know there, how is this word uh, know used in the Bible? Let semantics. Me see. No, it's not semantic. Coming from the king of semantics. <laughs> anyway, as I'm saying, listen. This word know, in, uh, in, it's that, that, that passage is found in Mark and also in Matthew. Yeah. There are parallel verses, okay? He didn't know that one. Okay. Absolutely, I didn't know that one. Okay, these are, found, these are parallel verses, okay? So we see this. Now, what does the early church teach about this? They, they, they use this, and uh, John, St. John Chrysostom says that this is not to be taken literally, this is to be taken figuratively. As in the Old Testament, where it says, you can shake your head, Hashem, because you've never heard this argument. Anyway. It's a fast fist bump no, 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 moment, no, no, I have one, to do one, that. One second, one second. St. John Chrysostom taught, as it says in the Old Testament, this word no is used in different ways. When it says, Adam knew his wife Eve, this is talking about the moment of consummation of the marriage when they had sex. Now, does it mean that he didn't know his wife before he had sex? Absolutely not. Now, the St. John Chrysostom teaches, and the Apostolic Church, Church taught, that this is, Jesus Christ said this in the same sense that that language is used. Does it mean the husband... So did he know or not? Does it, the mean, hour. does it mean the husband doesn't know his wife so he before, lied then. before he has sex? <laughs> he, he knew, but he lied. Stop interrupting. Okay. Does it mean that the, wife, the husband does not know the wife before they have sex? No, of course not. It's, it's a term used in, in Hebrew that is, that is quite often used. Now, when he says, um, he says that I do not know the hour, this is a figurative speech according to uh, St. John Chrysostom, because if Jesus said this is going to be the last day, the disciples would not be focused. Jesus also said all the things that were going to happen before that day comes. And he also said that day will come like a thief in the night. So he didn't want to tell them the exact day, although we do have Christian heretics who say he's coming on this date. They tried to set a date. See, Christ, Christ said not to do that. Exactly. Now, does Christ know all things? In the same gospel, you continue reading. At the end of John chapter 21, it says, Peter says to Jesus, we know that you do know all things. So when you marry these up, it makes perfect sense. It's figurative, not literal. Christ, according to John chapter 21, knows all things. And once again, I'd like to point out, Hashim's answered nothing I've said. He's just done the Hashim shuffle. So the this point, this point, this point. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, no, we're not shaking hands in the coronavirus thing. I was hoping you wouldn't stand that close either, but you kept coming close. I don't know. Why are you going away now? Hello, my last statement. No, but mine. You started, remember? I know you couldn't wait to run away, could you? <laughs> after that beating, after that beating, he wants to scram out of here. Okay. So the important thing is this. Remember, what did he do? Instead of saying, answering the question about the immortality, he runs to the title of Jesus, King of Kings. You know the Pharaohs. They had such titles like the King of Kings, yes? Lord of this and uh, Lord of that. Does that mean they are God according to his logic? They will be God. So do not run to the title of Jesus when my question was specifically about his nature, whether he was immortal or mortal. Anyway, he has said many times, the second person of Trinity died, second person of Trinity died, second person of Trinity died. That means he is not immortal. That itself will end the story here with these guys here who claim that Jesus is God Almighty because the Father never died, yes? In any shape, or form, he did not die. He is always immortal. That's why it says over there, he alone is immortal. And he did the same thing with regards to the omniscience of Jesus. So he's saying that is a metaphorical, uh, uh, sorry, answer. The question was very specific. The question asked to Jesus is about the last hour. Now, why would Jesus deceive them if he knew the answer already? Either he knew it 
or he was telling a lie that he did not know because he specifically says who didn't know the hour. He also says the angels didn't know the hour. Is that metaphoric as well? Maybe they knew. Maybe the angels knew the hour. And Jesus is being metaphorical here. This is the logic of these Christians that we have to deal with in the park here. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh did that. Finished these guys a long time ago before Brother Hijab was here. So they were finished. They were finished. They were finished. Yes, they does shake you. <laughs> you see how they're shaking just the name of Hijab. Mashallah, he's a modern, modern day uh, preacher in the park who actually gives them some sort of insecurity as well. So now what we are doing here is that we have Christians like him who actually lean on self-interpretation. So there I say Jesus of Mark 13, 32 and the passage in Matthew as well, that this is metaphorical. So maybe metaphorically the, uh, the angels knew, maybe the men knew as well because he says nobody knows the hour. Maybe the men knew as well. Maybe you know, yes? Yes, what I'm saying is that Jesus did not know the hour because he says the sun does not know. Nobody knows the hour, not the angels in heaven. Nor the son. Who is the son here? He's explicitly and exclusively stating that he didn't know the hour. And then he says at the end, only the father knows. Now, according to your Christology, the father is not the son. And the son is not the Holy Spirit. So we know for a fact that only the father means exclusively this knowledge is only with the father, not the son. It's not metaphoric. This is an explicit statement to an explicit question about the last hour. So stop running around in circles. Yes, you're making so many faults in your own uh, interpretations that you don't even realize. Now, this is what we are dealing with today. They will go and misinterpret. Remember that Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for this? What did Jesus rebuke them? Because they were twisting the scriptures, which is exactly, we have Christians like this today who twist the scripture. It says in the Quran, in chapter 279, that they actually, they actually make up the words and they attribute it to God. And then they say, these are the words of God. And this is what is happening. In the Quran, they've been rebuked. Jesus has rebuked them. What is Jesus saying, John 14, 24? That those who love me will keep my teachings. Yes, because he is clearly stating that his words are not his, but his words are that of his God, the one who sent him. Yes. Yeah, that is his God. He says, I go to my father and my God. In, in John, stop interrupting, it's my turn. I didn't chapter. John 20, John 20, 17, he says, remember this. He keeps saying the father. Yes, the father, according to Jesus, is his God. Because in John 20, 17, he says, I go to my father and your father, my God and your God. And on the Christ cross, when he was about to die, what did he say? My God, my God. He didn't say my father. My God, my God, why did you abandon me? Can you believe this? The Trinity is broken at that point because God Almighty abandoned the other God who according to him is also God Almighty. Now this is a death knell to them from Jesus' own statement and that's the reason you cannot prove from Jesus' statement that he's all God, uh, God Almighty. And I think John 73 is the final nail in the coffin of these Christians and they should now know that they have been crucified totally based on this John 73 where Jesus testifies very clearly this is eternal life that they may know you. Here, you is the Father. That they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you send. The only true God is who? The God of Jesus Christ, the Father. With that, we finish this discussion. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.